Hello, and welcome to another edition of Inside Family Court. My guests today are Family Court Judge Jerry Bowles and licensed clinical psychologist Dr. Sally Brinzel. Thank you both for being here today. Our topic is child custody evaluations. And Judge Bowles, as we start out, would you give us a, a working definition from the perspective of the bench uh, as to what a child custody evaluation is? Sure, Bill. Custody is sometimes a difficult term for people to understand that come into the system. When the court refers to custody from a legal standpoint, basically it means who's going to make the decisions involving a minor child. Um, and sometimes that's confused with parenting time or parenting schedules as to the actual time that the child or children are going to spend with each parent. Um, custody decisions typically involve both from a generic standpoint of who's going to make the decisions as far as where the child goes to school, what the religious upbringing of that child or children are going to be, what the health care treatment, uh, what health care treatment is going to be provided to the children, but also when we're using a custody evaluation, we're looking for recommendations on how that child's time should be divided with the parents and if there should be any restrictions or um, any controls on either of the parents' access or time with those children. And as a, a function of process, how do we get to that point? That is, how do we end up with a custody evaluation? Okay, typically when a divorce action is filed or it could be a paternity action, the parties maybe were never married, but there's been a determination as to who the father is and the father is asking for some access to that child or um, those parties have been unable to agree as to what the custody arrangement or the time sharing of those children should be and so a motion for sole custody may be filed by one of the parties may be filed by both of the parties or a motion for primary possession or primary residence uh, mother or father each wanting the child to primarily reside in their home the court then has to make that decision if the parties can't agree and the custody evaluation would be ordered by the court if I believe that I need the help of a professional and information from a professional as to um, how that decision should be made. So Dr. Brunzel, Judge Bowles issues an order uh, and he wants a custody evaluation. What does that mean to you as a clinical psychologist? What that means to me is that he's looking for some feedback about the mental health of the, of the family system, of the child and the parents, what's in the psychological best interest of that child as that child goes through life post-separation of the parents or post-divorce, and what's the best fit. How can we best support the growth and ongoing development of this child as these parents no longer live together or co-parent? Judge, do we, do we do evaluations in every case? No. Um, there are many cases where evaluations aren't necessary. Um, but there are also many cases where evaluations are necessary. Um, if I had to guess, I'd probably say that I'm ordering evaluations in as many cases or possibly in more cases than I'm not ordering them where custody is truly um, contested between the parties. Dr. Rungel, as we, you do a custody evaluation, uh, are there criteria that you follow? Is there a protocol that you typically follow? Sure. Uh, the APA, which is American Psychological Association, puts out guidelines for psychologists to follow so that there's a standard process. There's a reason as to why we ask, what we ask, what we're looking for when we're talking about the needs of a child. So there's a standard sort of procedure. It consists of interviews, observation, giving parents and children tasks uh, so that I can take a look at that interaction, talking to collaterals, perhaps making a home visit. You say collaterals, I'm going to stop you there. Uh -huh. what's, what's a collateral? Schools uh, okay. are always good collaterals because children's behavior and achievement in school is just a really good reflection of how they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, any type of secondary caregiver, uh, such as daycare or babysitter that's been involved or a grandparent mm -hmm. or another family member. Certainly any mental health professional that's involved in the case or social services. Pretty much anybody who's got a bird's eye view or some connection to that child historically and, and even perhaps in the future. Is there also uh, standardized testing involved? Yes, there is. 
um, almost all of the psychological test available be, could be used, but it really depends on what the question is. What's the issue? What's the contention? Is it a, a mental health issue? Is it an alcohol drug abuse? Was there domestic violence? Is it a simple issue of best fit? That's going to determine what kind of test a psychologist would use. And Dr. Brunzel raises a good point. Judge, some, you know, does each referral look the same, or are some of your referrals targeted? Typically, the referrals are fairly consistent. Um, they're, they're pretty much a form. I have a list of things that I want an evaluator to look at from the mental stability and, and the um, focus of the parents to their attachment and bonding to, their chil to the children. Um, now, in many cases, there are specific issues that also need to be addressed. And so the order where I would order the custody evaluation, um, I, I would tailor that specifically if there were certain things that I was looking for about how long does it take to do one of these evaluations? It really depends on the complexity of the case. I generally spend 10 to 20 hours of direct face-to-face -face contact with parents and children in the course of a custody evaluation and probably another four to five hours with collaterals by telephone, mm -hmm. by consultation, by reading reports, records. Do you uh, speak with them together or individually or both? It really depends. Uh, if I think there's something this, uh, these two parents can work on together, uh, that's always constructive. If mm -hmm. they can come to some of their own decisions and focus on the best interest of the child, I will put them together. That's not often. Uh, generally, by the time they get to me, it's pretty adversarial, and I'll see them separately. I do see each parent with the child or children so I see them as a combination. All right. What about uh, the time that you spend with uh, the children relative to ages? Uh -huh. to what, what impact is age on, on what you can do and what oh, you can observe? A lot. A lot. I think adolescent children can be interviewed. I think I can talk with them about how it's going at home, what they like about each parent's home and how that goes, what's positive, what they don't like perhaps about the visitation schedule, what they'd like to change, what they need, what they want. Um, children under the age of, and it really de de depends on maturity rather than age, but I'm going to give okay. it an age just to understand. Sure. Um, under 12, I start talking perhaps more indirectly because I don't think children under 12 should be given the idea that they have power to make that decision. Mm -hmm. It's too big of a bond. A lot of weight, isn't it? It's a lot of weight. Um, so I want to ask indirect questions. I want to get to know them as, as kids uh, mm -hmm. so I can make some determination from what their parents are telling me and then how I get to know that child and how that child's perspective is of their world mm -hmm. that I can make some combination. Do you find that even perhaps with infant children you, mm -hmm. you can get some nonverbal indication of w where they are and what their bonding situation is? That's very difficult at an infant stage. You can get some ideas. I sure observe parents with their infants mm -hmm. and, and you can get some but that's very difficult. Infants have a dependency to be taken care of and they will generally if there's only one person available will we'll go to that person mm -hmm. for care. Mm -hmm. So it's a little tricky but I sure do watch it. You finish your interviews, you've finished mm -hmm. your testing, mm -hmm. uh, you've spoken with all your collateral sources, what happens next? Basically what happens is I put all of that together, uh, integrate the information in a report that goes to the judge and the party's attorneys, and that report says this is what I've found, uh, and based on what I've found, based on this data, this is what I recommend. All right. When we come back from break, we'll talk about what the judge does with the report. Thank you both. We're back with Judge Bowles and Dr. Brinzel. Judge, the doctor's finished her report. She's made her recommendations. It's arrived on your desk in the mail. What next? Well, as soon as the report comes in, before it goes in the file, I have an opportunity to review that report. Um, and we'll read it in its entirety. It then gets filed into the file. What often happens once a report's made, it gives some barometer for the attorneys and the parties to then sit down and have some serious negotiations. What I find is that after an evaluator makes recommendations, that frequently the parties are able to be more realistic with what their strengths and weaknesses are and how the court's likely to structure any custody arrangement or parenting schedule. So 
from that perspective, it settles a lot of cases. I think that, that people listening might get the impression that uh, you know, this one factor has so much weight uh, that it renders the other statutory factors you know, perhaps irrelevant. Do you, do you feel like that's really true in, in your way of thinking? or? No, absolutely not. Um, the custody evaluation is simply that. It's an evaluation done by a professional um, who has specific knowledge uh, and information for um, interpreting the kinds of information that's sought for the evaluation and that gives me a lot of insight in making my decision if the parties based on the recommendations and the information contained in the report aren't able to reach an agreement then the case is ultimately tried. I will use the information and the recommendations in that evaluation as a part of my decision, but that never becomes the decision. The court's decision is never given to another person, and certainly not in this case. However, there's a lot of useful information. There may be things as the case is developed that I've become aware of or dynamics that were playing out um, that never were presented to the evaluator. Um, to give you a real quick example, I had a custody evaluation um, several years ago where there was a lot of information about some histrionic um, uh, traits of the mother. Uh, the mother was a, a very uh, passive, uh, what was not nearly as, as structured and, and as um, um, task-oriented as the father was and the child wasn't doing real well in school, although the mother was cited to be very uh, emotionally supportive and affectionate and nurturing of the child. Um, dad was very kind of militaristic and that type of thing and the recommendation for this child because he was having some struggling in school and with schoolwork being completed that the child would be, uh, the recommendation was the child would be primarily placed with father. But in fact what I knew was that there had been a long history of domestic violence in this home and that dad had um, used that um, those traits in, in a very physical controlling way that led to the breakup of this family and so um, I came up with a decision that allowed dad to have a meaningful relationship with the child but the primary care and nurturing was still provided by the mom. Um, and I think that raised an excellent, an excellent issue uh, and I'll pass this back to you Dr. Brenzel on, on in terms of the you know, the circumstances uh, under which the evaluation is taking place. Now, a lot of people, you know, they, they feel like their time with their child is, is what's at stake here. Uh, their level of anxiety is naturally just as high as it can possibly be. Uh, is that accounted for in, in your process and, and, and how do you account for that? Sure, it has to be accounted. Um, that's a very stressful place to be. I think a lot of people that enter my office feel like I'm going to investigate and sort of open their darkest closets and that's scary, mm -hmm. especially when you say what's at stake is their time with and parenting of their child. Mm -hmm. Um, generally, both parents are in that position, so you know I, I can expect that that's going to be somewhat equal. However, if there's been some allegation against one of the parents and there's more weight in that direction, say there's been a psychiatric history or a history of drug or alcohol abuse, that parent is, is absolutely going to be even more stressed mm -hmm. by the process. I've got to take that into account mm -hmm. and do everything I can to settle the parents down as much as possible, make them as comfortable as possible so I can get the best information. I think on a, on a related topic, uh, I know that, that uh, you know, sometimes we have medical professionals who are divorcing. Sometimes we have uh, uh, other psychologists. Lawyers even. even. Lawyers every <laughs> once in a while. Uh, and uh, there are concerns that uh, because of that person's vocation, somehow mm -hmm. they are going to be able to cheat these tests or, or uh, you know, put a better foot forward because mm -hmm. of their inside knowledge, if you will, than, mm -hmm. than uh, someone who didn't have that knowledge. Uh, is that accounted for in your process? Sure it is. On, on most psychological tests, there are validity scales. There are ways to pick up how that person was trying to present themselves or what they were trying to put forward in the testing results. And if you get someone who's consistently trying to beat the test like that, you can go even more abstract um, to Rorschach 
right. which is ink blots, and people right. don't understand what I'm looking for, so it's hard to kind of throw the test. You have to be careful, of course, because the more abstract you get, the less scientific the process is. Um, but I, I think that's sort of the expertise that the psychologist brings to it. I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people who have agendas to try and get me to believe or to think they're feeling or thinking a certain way. And that's part of the process I bring to it, is to sift through that. And if, if a person has a special expertise and comes in using all of the right language, I'm going to sift through sure. that. Sure. As you, you do this testing, um, assuming that you're, you're looking at the emotional health, obviously, uh -huh. of the parties involved, sure. perhaps the, the children, whether there are any special needs. Absolutely. Um, what about uh, parenting skills? Are there ways to, to get a feel for, for how the person is doing as a parent? Sure. Uh, I can watch that happen. I can give a, a task or a discipline, or I can ask a parent to teach their child something, and I can watch that process. So I can observe. Again, collaterals give me a lot of good information, especially schools, about parents' involvement and how they support or don't support the child's learning. Uh, what kind of feedback they're getting from the parent through the, sco through the school year. There are some uh, questionnaires that parents can fill out about their perspectives of the child, how they parent, how they discipline, what they think their strengths and weaknesses are, and I sure use those, Very along good. with just interviewing. Very good. Well, Judge Bowles, uh, Dr. Brunsell's tested me, and despite the fact that I've been raising my daughter for 15 years, uh, she's recommending that, that custody be placed with the mother, and I don't like the report. And she's wrong about half of what she said, and some of I didn't even ever say. What are my options? Well, your options always are to go and have another expert do a similar evaluation, and that happens a lot of times. Typically, once the custody report comes out, with the court-appointed custody evaluator, one of the parties won't be happy because typically it recommends one parent over another for primary parenting. Um, that other party always has the option of submitting to testing from their own expert and determining if that expert agrees with the expert that the court has appointed. And that doesn't happen a lot. Number one, the evaluation process is somewhat expensive. So to um, engage it twice becomes doubly expensive. Um, but that's obviously an option. Um, and then your case is always going to be heard by the court if you don't reach an agreement. I mean, obviously the ideal situation is for parents who are going to continue to share a child to reach decisions mutually. And so when they can reach decisions mutually, they can have some flexibility in that arrangement um, because it's impossible for me to craft an order as to how those parents will uh, co-parent those children and take into account all of the activities that are going to come up in the life of that child and of those families. So, but in the event that you can't, and that's basically what we're talking about here, then the court's always going to hear the case, and you'll have your opportunity to tell the court. I, I didn't tell Dr. Brenzel um, X or Y, or I, I didn't say that, or in spite of the fact that my ex-wife says I did um, something during the marriage uh, to the child or to her, that's not true. That, that's information that she's given to try to sway the, the evaluation. And so there's cross-examination of uh, the people who Dr. Brenzel may have used as collaterals. Those individuals can be called into court, put under oath to, to have them testify if the information they gave is accurate. And so just the typical trial process. Thank you, Judge. When we come back from break, I want to talk a little bit more about the cost. I think that's a concern to a lot of people. When we left off, we were talking about costs, and a lot of people uh, fear uh, child custody, uh, true child custody litigation because of the costs. Uh, Dr. Brinsley, you're probably the best person, at least, uh, to begin this discussion with in terms of what, what does the cost, the average cost, of a true custody evaluation? It's hard to say what the average is because the question can be so uh, different. It can be a very simple question of best fit, mm -hmm. two healthy parents, good attachments to the children, and what's the best fit, what's the best parenting schedule, all the way to an incredible complex family system where there's all sorts of symptomatology and mental health problems. You can see what kind of difference in time sure. we're talking about in process. 
Um, a, a range might be anywhere from $1,500 to $5,000 locally, depending on those issues. Mm -hmm. You get outside of Kentucky and it gets quite a bit more expensive, quite exactly. honestly. Mm -hmm. Judge, uh, from a family that just doesn't have that kind of money, my custody issues are, I believe, as serious as those from families who do have the money to pay Dr. Brunzel between two and five thousand dollars, and I've certainly seen it go much, much higher than that. Uh, is there any accommodation for that? That's a good question, Bill. Um, obviously, the decision that I make, I want as much information from a family whose means may be very meager um, as when I make a decision for a family who may be very wealthy. Um, it's still a child and, and the safety and the, the, the future development of that child is, is just as important. And so we try to make accommodations. I know the experts that I use um, have sliding scales that may be appropriate based on incomes. Um, as attorneys, I think uh, psychologists and uh, licensed clinical social workers who are, who are doing this kind of work do some pro bono work and Sally's probably a better one to answer that. There are some cases where I will really struggle to decide if I can make an appropriate decision without a custody evaluation and nobody is going to be denied a custody claim because they can't afford a custody evaluation. I think that's um, really important. I will hear whatever evidence is available to me but it's very important for me to get the best information that I can get. And so that's the struggle that we have with custody evaluations because I've heard people say, I can't get custody because I can't afford an evaluation. And, and that's not true. And that's not true. I think that's important information. Let's talk about another uh, preconception, perhaps misconception. Uh, and that is that uh, if you're a female, uh, you're going to get your young children. Or well, the presumption is, is that young child should be with you, Dr. Brendan? Boy, I should think that was automatic up to 10 years ago. I think we've seen a real change in how we view attachment um, and how we view primary caregivers and the importance of fathers in children's lives. To me, I start out equal. These are two parents. Mm -hmm. um, their gender really makes no difference. Um, it's, it's much more complicated than that, and has to be, mm -hmm. has to be. It's, it's who can provide the best environment over time for this child. Mm -hmm. Judge Bull. My goal when parties come in with custody issues that I have to decide is for them to leave with both mother and father having a meaningful relationship with the child. And so if I can structure some kind of timeshare which allows both parties meaningful contact, um, that's, that's my goal. Now, th that's not always the result of what my findings are based on the proof once it starts coming in. Is there a gender bias not in my court? Um, I have two young boys, one who's seven, one who's 11. My wife has traveled since each of them were, were six weeks old. Um, I've got up for the nighttime feedings. I've been very attached and bonded to my boys and, and would expect to always play a major role in their life regardless of um, their mother and I's relationship and I expect that that's true with most people. Um, I can't split children but I can split time and parenting and there's usually some solution that I can come up with that's going to allow both parties to have fairly equal uh, time and, and, and responsibilities with the children and I think regardless of, of what parents' faults are, there's always something that they have that they can offer to those children. And it, regardless of, of um, those faults, I think it's important to, to match the parents with the children. Mm -hmm. Dr. Brunzel, we just got a, a minute or two. You see so many of those. Mm -hmm. You only spend 20 hours or so with this family. Mm -hmm. uh, how difficult is this process on you? Oh, I think it's extremely difficult. Uh, I think both Judge Bowles and I would say that it's very intense, it's very important. These are critical recommendations that I make and decisions that he makes. Um, I think we take each one of them very seriously and, and understand what these parents are fighting for. 
and how important those attachments are. One of the first things I ask parents, let me see a picture of your child or children. Mm -hmm. um, I've got to make that connection very fast that my point here is these children mm -hmm. and my focus is these children. Judge Bowles, you see, you see so many of these. How can you possibly agonize over each one? You do, Bill. Um, you absolutely do. I need to make sure every time I make a decision as to where these children are going to be that it's the best decision I can make. And it's a difficult one because I don't have the information that I want. I never could have enough information. Mm -hmm. um, but I try to make use of the information the best that I can. And with every decision that I make, I think a piece of me goes with that decision. Mm -hmm. I take them very serious. Dr. Brunzel, Judge Bowles, thanks for being with me today.